the diorama. Before he had made it across the parking lot, the sky opened its heavenly urethra and pissed on Martin Taper, raining hot and foul. It pooled in the whack-a-mole potholes of the Price Kingdom shopping center, each puddle a window into a more promising dimension. The Martin that existed in those watery portals was a spy or a superhero or a warrior of the post-apocalyptic wastes, not a lowly clerk facing down a nine-hour shift under the whip of branch manager Ethan Nolby. Martin sighed and raised his eyes to the value pet, his retail tomb that stank not of decay, but of dog paws and cat dander. As he approached the automatic doors, he caught a glimpse of his face in the glass, rainwater pasting his hair into the beaten lines of his brow. The doors gasped open, dry as a pharaoh's curse, and he dragged himself into the hopeless flicker of fluorescence, his feet squeaking out a requiem on the charcoal-flecked linoleum. Nulby was waiting where he always was, by the register closest to the door. He counted that damn register so many times during the day it was a wonder it hadn't learned to count itself. That was to be Martin's whipping post for the next four hours, the sun that his desolate solar system was destined to orbit. After that he'd be consigned to the aisles, where he would close out his sentence stocking the shelves with cans of horse meat and bags of stale-smelling kibble. But at least he'd be closer to Allison McCarthy when he was out in the floor the only bright spot in his otherwise excruciating day. Hey, tapeworm, Nulby greeted, the opening salvo in today's belittlements. It was a sad act of manifest destiny that a sap with the name Taper would end up a clerk in a store that sold parasite medications, arming the bullying manager with a nickname to wield his ridicule. But Martin took it with his customary good humor, because what was he supposed to do? The world was full of Ethan Nulbys. Martin had endured them all throughout his school years, where his failure to engage with curriculum had doomed him to a lifetime crushed beneath the heels of middle management. It was in those frivolous days of youth that Martin first conceived his diorama, a world all his own that allowed him to live out fantastical dreams, heart-rending romances, and nail-biting edge-of-your-seat adventures. The diorama was a microcosm, untethered to banality, where Martin Taper was authority supreme, and there was no room for a value pet and no place for a bottom feeder like Nulby to gain a foothold. It waited back at his apartment, silent under the eaves, ready to salve Martin from the cruelty that the next eight hours would undoubtedly inflict. Your counts were short again last night. Nulby informed him with phony regret, as if not savoring every scrumptious, reprimanding bite. Why didn't you mention it at the end of the shift? Because I did a count again this morning. The exalted branch manager was indignant that a lowly clerk would deign to question his command of protocol. It became clear to Martin that this day was going to be worse than anticipated, a slow, protracted strangulation. Sorry, Ethan. I'll try to stay focused on my transactions. See that you do. Nulby's eyes fell hungrily on Allison, who was just coming in the door, her smile soft and deferent. Martin wanted to tear out those eyes and drop them into the python tank where the snakes, mistaking them for mice, would devour them with a pop. Four hours passed, much as Martin imagined it would at a gulag. He had several returns from belligerent pet owners who claimed Value Pet's cheap, off-brand pet food had, unsurprisingly, made their precious angels sick. His last customer was a 300-pound woman who berated him through quivering jowls while her yipping chihuahua struggled in arms the size of ham hocks. By the time Martin's shift relief arrived, the dog's hysterical, high-pitched bark had been drilled into his head in a torturous loop. He was still hearing the little monster long after its corpulent mommy had stomped out the door like a disgruntled mastodon. Nulby took the cash drawer into the office to count it, and Martin went dutifully into the aisles to finish out his shift. 
Passing by the grooming center, he offered Allison a smile that he had practiced for the better part of the morning. One that would hide his desperation, but not come off as too cocky either. She returned with her own, and entering the stockroom, Martin allowed his heart the faintest whiff of hope, the slightest tingle of possibility. But that was all gone by the time he dragged his first bag of kitty litter out to the display in aisle seven. Allison was talking to Jeremy, a handsome young graduate who had just started at the store's veterinary clinic. Martin had seen them talking before, but he had blinded himself to their obvious and growing attraction. Now here was Jeremy sneaking a kiss, and by the playful way Allison giggled and pushed him away, it was clear that this thing between them had grown far beyond a harmless workplace flirtation. Of course, Martin was months, if not years, away from finding the courage to ask Allison out, but it didn't make the sight of her fresh, flowering love any less of a blow to his heart. "'Your drawer was short again,' a voice stabbed in his ear. He turned to find Nulby standing there, smiling with insufferable smugness. Martin knew for certain that his drawer was not short. He had gone over all his transactions twice, three times, even four if the customer was being particularly difficult. He had counted every dollar, fingered every penny, double-checked every credit slip, and there was no way in hell that his count was off. Nulby was up to something, skimming from the till, but Martin was powerless to prove it. Stop by the office when you finish your shift, his lying thief of a boss ordered. I have to write you up this time. On a normal day, Martin might have been able to muster up some defense against his accuser, but he was too wounded by Allison in that coffin nail of a kiss to put up a fight. So he said nothing, finished his shift, took his write-up slip without protest, and went home to the one place in this miserable world where he mattered. The Pembertons were fighting again when he arrived at his gray, weather-worn triplets, and poor Dennis Pemberton was occupying his usual sad spot on the bowed and splinter-promising front porch stoop. Dennis, who had to be a forgotten birthday shy of nine, spent a lot of time on that stoop as his parents, whom Martin had never laid eyes on, spent their time inside the ground-floor apartment fighting and generally ignoring their son. For some reason, the kid brightened when he saw Martin coming. Hi, he squeaked in his broken, I've been crying for two hours voice. Hey, Dennis, Martin returned. He stepped past the boy who was etching something into the perennially wet and rotting wood with what appeared to be a snapped-off twig. Maybe it was because he recognized the lonely spark of vestigial creativity in the boy but Martin was suddenly struck with the unusual impulse to extend himself. The poor kid seemed so beaten by life already, and the truth was that it wasn't likely to get any better, at least not if Martin's life was any indication. His formative years had echoed this boy's more than he cared to admit, but he didn't want to dwell on it or try to offer some saccharine platitude. What Martin wanted to do was go upstairs and play with his diorama, so maybe the greatest charity he could offer this gloomy, doomed child was to share with him the sweet relief of imagination. You want to see something cool? It didn't occur to Martin until afterwards how much this rang like the enticement of a child molester, but he was sure it was lost on Dennis, and he couldn't see the kid's ever-quarreling parents giving a damn. Dennis accepted gratefully, and the two of them took the narrow stairs to Martin's attic apartment, which was the smallest of the three apartments in the converted old house. The journey always left Martin winded, even though the steps couldn't have counted more than thirty. It was his soul that was exhausted more than his body. The apartment was dark, as Martin had no reason, neither pet nor roommate, to leave lights on while he was at work. Also, he enjoyed the effect the diorama had when the lights were suddenly lit, and he found that having someone there to share the reveal made it all the sweeter. He reached for the yellowed wall-mounted switch and paused for dramatic effect. "'You ready?' he asked Dennis. The boy answered with an anticipating nod, his eyes still glassy from crying. Martin smiled, the shadows filling in the haunted hollows of his face, and he flicked the switch on with a snap. The room lit up, revealing a miniature world. 
cardboard skyscrapers grasped for a sky twinkling with Christmas light stars. Beneath them, streets of gray tile spread out like a great clean-lined web, edged with carefully molded plastic curbs and tiny iridescent street lamps, the kind you found in a model train kit. Toy cars of every make and era crowded the thoroughfares, giving the city a claustrophobic feel of authentic habitation. Inside the cars, miniature commuters sat with grim looks on their faces, trapped in a hellish gridlock that would never clear. Beyond the city, mountains of buckled turf rose, hinting at a world outside the diorama. It was all so detailed and thoroughly convincing that Dennis couldn't help but gasp. It gave Martin a thrill bordering on the perverse. Well, Martin asked, knowing full well the answer. Pretty cool, huh? Dennis answered, yeah, as if he had just wandered into a secret and private Disneyland, which in a sense he had. His eyes were lit with the sort of youthful wonder Martin had all but forgotten existed, and it made him smile so broadly that his atrophied cheek muscles cramped in protest. With a sweeping gesture, he bid Dennis enter, and the kid stepped awestruck into the steepled room. On a chipboard shelving unit, the players of this magnificent little universe were arranged in neat rows like some strange shrunken militia. They came in many shapes and varying scales, some highly articulated while others immobile, but they were all born of the same plastic brotherhood. There were hunched over and hobbling old folks, leather adorned gangs of every ethnicity, suit and tie office drones and corporate raiders. Moms and their children, ready for food shopping and playground afternoons. But lording above them, on the highest shelf, were the main players. The heroes and villains. The demons and demigods that commanded real power in this fantastical realm. They were the linchpins around which all dramas played out, and their sculpted, costumed physiques made them impossible to ignore. Dennis walked over to the shelving unit with the respect of a pilgrim approaching a holy altar. He gazed awestruck at the figures on the top shelf, at the superheroes, villains, monsters, and robots. Martin could sense that Dennis wanted to reach out, longed to hold one of them in his fevered little palms, but that he felt somehow unworthy. This warmed Martin to Dennis. The kid seemed to know when he was in the presence of something truly mystical. Martin considered letting him pick out some figures and build a scenario, but he just couldn't allow it. The day had been far too agonizing to offload his much-needed release to a child who would likely be satisfied having the characters play nice. No, there needed to be some real conflict in tonight's course of events, some high-stakes action and violence. Mythic stories demanded to be bold and operatic. Martin had a knack for this without ever having tried his hand at fiction. Writing was for dreamers, after all, and his dreams had long since dried up and blown away. The diorama was all he had, and it would provide him with all the catharsis he needed. Dennis would be his student for the evening, Martin decided, and to the boy's credit, he seemed a courteous, eager pupil. So, Martin said after he felt the silence had given the moment proper dramatic weight, I think tonight will be a Black Shroud adventure. Dennis beamed excitedly as if Martin was some delightful hybrid of both Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Who's the Black Shroud? Poor deprived child, Martin thought, smiling internally. It was true, the Black Shroud was not as popular as A-list heroes like Batman or Daredevil. He was a lesser-known character, some might say knockoff, but Martin preferred the term loving homage, from a comic book series long since relegated to the dustbins of obscurity. As such, the Shroud had a wide-open playing field, dramatically speaking, allowing Martin to author his adventures without the shackles of a lengthy backstory and studied canon. It also allowed Martin to graft aspects of his personality to the black-clad Avenger, and made the Shroud his regular avatar. He took the action figure down from its vaunted place upon the shelf and held it before Dennis's rapturous eyes. 
He could see the boy's mind dancing across the contours of the figure, lingering in the folds of the hooded, enveloping cloak, probing at the mystery hidden in that cold, expressionless mask. "'Is he like Batman?' Dennis asked. "'Better,' Martin answered definitively. He took the figure and went over to the diorama, placing the shroud on his favorite perch, Forsyth Tower." a gothic skyscraper adorned with stern gargoyles and extended outcroppings. There the Avenger was in his true element, a shadowy sentinel waiting to strike. Now all that was needed were wrongdoings for the Shroud to set right. As he often did in these precarious moments of creation, Martin rifled through his mental checklist of torments and injustices to find inspiration. And today, the source of his greatest anguish was Allison and that bone-headed Lothario she felt driven to smooch. How he would love to expose Jeremy as a fraud, a coward, unworthy of her pillowy lips. How he would love to tear the wool from her puppy-dog eyes, show sweet, innocent Allison McCarthy who the true hero was. And like that, the night scenario emerged fully formed. To represent Allison, Martin selected Dr. Millicent Chambers, a plucky archaeologist who is the central character in a series of jungle adventure films. The actress who played Millicent looked nothing like Allison, but in the distortion of Martin's feelings, the two were dead ringers, and in truth, the sculpt bore some resemblance if you looked at it right. Cemented as an avatar, Martin took Millicent down from the shelf and placed her on a lonely curbside free of traffic and other pedestrians but not free from the ever-watchful gaze of the Black Shroud. "'She looks so lonely there,' Dennis remarked. The boy was astute. "'Then why don't we give her a friend?' suggested Martin, his voice betraying a sly hint of knowing. He already had Allison's companion in mind, a smiling, clear-eyed brute hiding proudly, boastfully even, in the far back of one of the shelves." As if guided by providence, Martin turned back to the display, and reaching behind a row of better-loved figures, landed on the exact one he was looking for. He drew the toy out, careful not to topple the others, and presented its stupid, innocuous form to Dennis. The boy's eyes lit up. It's a fireman! That was not the desired effect, Martin inwardly groused. Of course, firemen were heroes to most children. He would have expected a worshipful reaction from an average mouth-breather. But Martin had hoped that Dennis, proving himself a kindred soul, would be different. In truth, Martin had nothing against firemen. They were heroes, after all. But he had everything against the all-American, beer-drinking, nerd-bullying archetype that he felt four-alarm Jim, the fireman in question, represented. So what better a stand-in for Jeremy? Yeah, he's a fireman, Martin conceded. But he's a dumb fireman. The word worked like a carefully targeted missile. Dennis scrunched up his face as if smelling a dog fart, and four-alarm Jim became plastic persona non grata in his easily swayed eight-year-old mind. Yeah, he's dumb. Martin took four-alarm Jim in one hand and Millicent in the other and forced their faces together, playing out the act of kissing in the most grotesque manner possible, complete with wet lip-smacking noises. This sent Dennis into gales of repulsed laughter, and his disapproval of Jim was finalized with the exclamation of, Gross! With most of the main cast in place, it was time for the inciting incident, the event that would set the action into motion. Turning back to the display, Martin's eyes were drawn to a sinister figure that stood hunched in the corner like a rat waiting to strike from the shadows. With a delicate, deliberate hand, he plucked up the nasty little character, careful to avoid pricking his finger on its pointed beak of a nose. This is Sketchy Crumb, Martin announced. He's a bad guy. Bad guy didn't really do Sketchy Crumb justice. He was a low-level thug, a bank robber, a drug peddler, a perennial supervillain henchman and all-around scumbag. And of course, in Martin's mind, Sketchy represented all of Ethan Nulby's finer qualities.
On a normal day, he would have been satisfied to have the Black Shroud simply collar sketchy after a robbery and pound his twisted face into the hard foam asphalt. But today had not been a normal day. Today, Sketchy had a greater purpose, a more vital role to play. Selecting a tiny pistol from a cabinet drawer, Martin put the weapon in Sketchy's hand and set him down in the diorama in front of Millicent and Jim. He positioned the criminal in an easily readable stick-up pose, gun out, and adjusted Millicent's arms so they were raised high over her pretty head in helpless surrender. Then, relishing the moment, he did the same for Jim, whose vocation as a firefighter apparently made him no less of a coward. Now came the fun part. This is a stick-up, Martin said in a sandpaper rasp that was meant to approximate Sketchy's cigarette-mangled voice. He reached into the scene and pivoted Sketchy, so he aimed the gun at Millicent, then Jim, then back to Millicent. Give me all your money. Dennis giggled, delighting in the mini-mugging. Switching characters effortlessly, Martin moved to Millicent, twisting her to look at Jim. "'Aren't you going to do something?' she protested in Martin's girl voice falsetto. "'I thought you were a big, tough fireman!' Martin moved again to Jim, jiggling him in a pantomime of cartoonish shivering. B -b -b "'But he's got a gun, Millicent!' As interpreted by Martin, Jim's voice was low and manly, but it squeaked high on the word gun to expose a decidedly unmanly terror. What am I supposed to do? Get myself shot? The fact that Jim's reluctance to be a hero was a perfectly reasonable real-world response had no bearing on his standing in the world of the diorama. He was now firmly and irrevocably a coward. Martin was pleased to see the judgment settling on Dennis's face even before Sketchy finished his demands. That's right, you big baby. Now empty your pockets and make it quick. Finally, the moment Martin had been anticipating arrived. Leaning his body carefully over the city streets, he snatched the black shroud from his skyscraper perch and swept him down on the scene, allowing his cloak to billow out dramatically. He landed the shroud directly behind the stick-up man and quickly positioned his muscled arms behind the drop of the cloak's folds. The hero stood there, calmly iconic, his statuesque readiness announcing him an indisputable badass. Judging from the wowed look on Dennis's face, the entrance was wholly effective. Sketchy crumb, the shroud announced in Martin's best husky growl. I thought I put you away for good last time. Curse you, Black Shroud, was the only cliché Sketchy had time to exclaim before the Shroud, guided by Martin's sure hand, swatted the gun from his molded plastic grip. It was a move Martin had perfected after long nights of play, and he was pleased to see that it met with the boy's enthusiastic approval. The Shroud's follow-up move was to knock Sketchy over, and with a quick adjustment to the elbow joint, the hooded Avenger slammed the criminal mercilessly into the curb. It was a tad brutal for a child's game, but Dennis seemed to take nothing from the dispatch but ecstatic, wide-eyed pleasure. Once the grim but heartily enjoyed takedown of Sketchy Crumb was over, the Shroud turned his masked attention to the young couple, whose frozen, smiling faces wordlessly expressed their gratitude. Not satisfied with that, Martin took Millicent and, lowering her arms, shoved her against the Shroud's molded musculature in the action figure version of a hug. "'Thank you, thank you,' Millicent said with Martin's octave-pitched voice. "'I don't know what would have happened if you hadn't come along.' You could almost see a look of shame assert itself on four-alarm Jim's normally oblivious face. Glad to be of help, ma'am. The line was more appropriate for a stalwart do-gooder like Superman or Captain America than a scourge of the night like the Black Shroud, but this show was for the benefit of a less sophisticated audience. I'd advise you to keep out of these streets after dark. You never know who you might run into. With that, the shroud was whisked back to the rooftops, leaving a moony-eyed Millicent in his wake. There goes a real man, she said to Jim, his emasculation now complete. 
It was a fine conclusion to the night's story, and Dennis clapped with appreciative glee. A howl was heard outside, the frustrated call of Dennis's mother looking for him in the backyard. Now there was a woman you did not want to piss off. I think you'd better get going, Martin urged his freshly minted acolyte. Dennis's shoulders slumped, the respite over, and he heeded his mother with the grim duty of a soldier returning to war. But before he walked out the door, he turned back to Martin. Can we play again sometime? he asked with an aching hope. We'll see, Martin said. Had he been a parent, he would have known that those words are the two that all wanting children dread hearing most. But Martin wasn't a parent, nor would he ever be, so that half-hearted commitment was the best he could do. Dennis took the answer with a wistful sulk and closed the door quietly behind him. The next day Martin was absently wandering the aisles, his mind plotting tonight's diorama, when he heard the heated sound of Allison and Nulby arguing. The infallible branch manager was admonishing Allison for the way she had handled an irate customer who had come in for a grooming without first making an appointment. Allison called Jeremy over to back her up, to tell Nulby that she had handled the situation as politely as possible and the customer, who had already been placated with a coupon for free dog food, was the one who behaved unreasonably. "'Sorry, babe,' Jeremy said with a shrug. "'I wasn't really paying attention.' This was not the show of support Allison had expected from her new boyfriend. Unable to stomach the look of betrayal that spread across her beautiful face, Martin stepped out from behind the aisle to right this injustice. He stood before them straight and heroic, channeling the grim righteousness of his hero, the Black Shroud. "'I heard the whole thing,' Martin lied. Allison was as polite as could be. The woman was totally out of line.' Nulby turned to him with his usual contempt. Woman? he questioned. The customer was a man. It was that old guy that comes in here with the Great Dane. It then occurred to Martin that he had assumed the troublesome customer was that heavy woman with the yipping chihuahua, and if he had only begun eavesdropping earlier, he wouldn't have made such a blunder. Sorry, he said, making a saving play. It sounded like a woman to me. Anyway, I did hear Allison, and she was nothing but nice. Allison looked to Martin, her face awash with gratitude. It felt like the first time she had really looked at him, seen him for the true strength of his character. Martin would have held that look on her face forever if he could have. It was worth any punishment Nulby could dish out. But for once, the flustered Nulby was uncertain on how to handle the situation, so he fell back on the tried-but-true default of managerial lecturing. Look, I don't know who was at fault, and I don't really care. I've been getting heat from the home office about customer service, and I need everyone to be on their absolute best behavior. Are you guys hearing me? There were nods all around, and then the intercom crackled, summoning Nulby to the front. He left in a hurry and without issuing Allison a write-up, which was all thanks to Martin's heroic intervention. To show her appreciation, Allison drew close and graced Martin's arm with a touch of her lily-white hand. "'Thank you, Martin,' she said. "'That was very sweet.' "'Yeah, good looking out, Marty,' Jeremy piped in. Allison turned on a dime, scalding him with her glare. "'You were some big help!' The sarcasm dripped from her mouth like sap from a wounded maple. Thanks for having my back. What was I supposed to do? Jeremy shot back defensively. Did you expect me to lie? Allison folded her arms in a huff of disappointment as Jeremy continued to stammer out selfish excuses. As much as he enjoyed seeing Jeremy squirm, Martin ducked back into the aisles and left the lovers to play out their quarrel. He could still hear them fighting all the way back at the rabbit hutches, and it gave him a pleasurable thrill that carried through the end of his shift. It wasn't until he was home, standing before the diorama, that Martin realized that the day's events had played out much as they had been prophesied in miniature the night before. Not to the letter, exactly. Nulby hadn't attempted an actual robbery, though there was Martin's suspicion that he was skimming from the registers, and the incident had not sadly ended in violence. 
But still, there were definite parallels to be drawn, and it didn't take a wild imagination to spot them. Of course that's ridiculous, Martin told himself. The diorama has no real power. Still, that night, for the first time in as long as he could remember, Martin fell asleep believing that all was right in his world. Things did not improve between Allison and Jeremy. The incident had been the final straw in a long line of broken-backed camels, and their once happy union was ended. For a week, their only exchanges were cold glares and clipped words, and the atmosphere between them was so toxic that their co-workers had taken to avoiding them. But not Martin. He swept into the void left by Jeremy, attempting conversation with Allison whenever his courage would allow, which was more and more frequently. Most of the time he found her brooding and unreceptive, but every now and then he managed to give her a little smile, a faint giggle or titter. Those moments, however small, were enough to make Martin feel as though he could conquer the world. Come Friday's afternoon switchover, he was in an uncommonly good mood. Nulby had been off his case all week, and he had added several new buildings to the diorama with which he was especially pleased. Parlaying this confidence into his campaign to win Allison, he went over to the grooming center to strike up a conversation and found her wrestling with a disgruntled Great Dane, likely belonging to the same troublesome customer who had besmirched her good name. The dog was in no mood for a nail clipping or a tooth brushing and was giving poor Allison a devil of a time, scrabbling on the tile and snapping at her with its great foamy jaws. Like a true hero, Martin stepped in to assist, and after some effort he and Allison managed to muzzle the beast and lift it up onto the stainless steel grooming gurney. Then, with the quick application of a noose-like restraining leash, the monster was secured. "'You're good with animals,' Allison remarked with a smile. "'Maybe you should ask to be trained on grooming.' "'Maybe I will,' said Martin, and for a moment he truly believed it. Then a loathsome presence intruded, shattering the spell and tearing down all of his confidence. "'Tapeworm!' Nulby spat. "'What the hell are you doing there behind the counter?' Martin turned to see his faux-hawked nemesis standing just outside the glassed-off borders of the grooming area, his face flushed and red. "'I was just helping Allison out,' Martin said, hating the simpering tone of his own voice. "'I'm on my way back to the floor right now.' Before Nulby could open his stupid mouth to respond, the Great Dane emitted a low gurgle that Martin assumed was just a growl of discomfort." But then the poor creature let loose its nervous bowels and spewed forth a putrid spray of diarrhea, coating the table in the front of Martin's store-mandated khakis. He didn't even have time to register the full extent of the mess before Nulby erupted into stabbing gales of laughter. "'Oh, you're helping, all right!' The miserable prick was savoring this shit-soaked humiliation as if it was the sweetest fruit imaginable. "'I tell you what!' You keep right on helping and clean up this mess. Then I want you back in the stockroom for the rest of your shift. I can't have customers seeing you like that. Nulby was still laughing as he sauntered off, leaving his pathetic underling to reek in misery. Martin anticipated a mocking giggle from Allison, or at least for her to choke back a gag, but instead she gave him a strained look of pity and went for some scented handy wipes. As he cleaned himself off, she assured him that it wasn't a big deal, that accidents like this happened all the time. And while that may have been true, the damage had already been done. Martin saw his chance with Allison exiting as swiftly as the bowels of that incontinent Great Dane. For the rest of the week, Martin set up scenario after scenario in which the Shroud took unholy vengeance on Sketchy Crumb, but reality remained unaffected. If anything, life under Nulby had worsened since the diarrhea incident, and Martin began to feel foolish for believing that his silly playset could have had some sort of magical effect on his very real and very miserable life. By Friday, Martin's confidence had been destroyed, and his interactions with Allison had faded entirely. 
Sulking home, he fantasized about hanging himself from the rafters of his apartment, wondered if his swinging feet would topple those proudly erected skyscrapers. He might have even gone through with it if Dennis hadn't been waiting at his place on the stoop. "'Hi, Martin,' Dennis greeted with a sort of manic enthusiasm. Martin could hear his parents arguing, as usual, inside the triplex. "'Do you think maybe we could play with your guys again tonight?' Making good on his half-hearted promise was the last thing Martin had on his mind, but the boy's desperate face pulled deep at his battle-worn sympathies. Despite wanting nothing more than to collapse into a depressive slumber, he invited Dennis inside. As soon as they entered the apartment, Dennis ran to the display shelf, and Martin was certain his childish zeal would result in catastrophe. But before he could protest, Dennis skidded to a respectful halt, once again proving a worthy protege. Go ahead, Martin permitted. Pick one. As if being granted the keys to the kingdom, the boy reached for the shelf to the highest ledge. His fingers grasped for a figure that stood there alone, as if the other toys had afforded it a wide berth out of terror. Martin's heart froze mid-pump. Why on earth, of all the figures he could choose? But Martin's thoughts were cut short by an icy shiver. This one, Dennis confirmed, his hand clutching the hateful, nightmare-inducing action figure in question. I want to play with this guy. He was referring to Mr. Simeon, the most fearsome of Martin's supervillains. Once a celebrated archaeologist who had gone insane in the jungle... Simeon now ruled the underworld from behind a terrifying mask, that of a tormented gibbon frozen mid-shriek. A tattered, pinstriped suit was his uniform, a mockery of his abandoned civility, and a white shock wig topped his head, completing the insane picture. He was a character Martin unleashed when scorched earth chaos was the only solution, and in truth there was a part of him that feared the figure, as crazy as that may have seemed. There was a power in that toy, dark and unholy, and here was Dennis wanting to let the proverbial monkey out of the barrel. That's Mr. Simeon, Martin warned. He's a bad guy. You sure you want him? There was not a shred of doubt in the boy's face. I think he's cool, he said, putting an end to the discussion. Okay, what do you want to do with him? Brandishing Simeon like a weapon, Dennis turned to the diorama, wheels spinning behind his furrowed brow. After a breathless moment, he stepped to the display, turning his gaze to the train station where Sketchy Crumb stood right where Martin had left him the night before. "'I hate that guy!' Dennis shouted, descending on Sketchy like a violent storm. He snatched the petty criminal up and held him face to face with Simeon, tiny fists trembling with rage. Martin could have sworn he saw a look of terror on Sketchy's normally smug, ugly face. Swept into the mania of the moment, Martin goaded his pupil on. Sketchy was supposed to do some work for Mr. Simeon, but he didn't do a good job. Maybe he should be punished. Dennis required no prodding. With a deft push of his thumb, he moved Simeon's grasping paw into position, raking it across Sketchy's newly terrified face. One strike wasn't enough, so he did it again and again, each time harder and more violent, acting out a terrible, orgiastic mauling. All Martin could do was stand there and watch as Dennis went to town with fevered abandon. When he finally finished, the kid was panting, the act an obvious expression of his own pent-up frustrations. But looking down at the figure still in his hand, he was disappointed with the lack of result. Nothing happened, he said through ragged breaths. Looks like something happened to me, Martin said, wondering what Dennis expected. But his face... Dennis held Sketchy out for Martin to inspect. It's still the same. It was true. The look of terror that Martin had imagined was gone, and Sketchy was back to his normal, thuggish self. Looking at that unrepentant plastic face, similar in so many ways to Nulby's, he fully understood the boy's dissatisfaction. Nulby, or Sketchy, rather, 
deserved worse than a simple beating. He deserved a punishment that would alter him permanently. I've got just the thing for that. Martin took Sketchy from Dennis, the boy offering no resistance. He went to the apartment's tiny kitchen and rummaged through some drawers, finding the item he was looking for, one of those long, tapered lighters used to relight burners. He flicked the thumb switch on the handle and flame flickered out like the tongue of a lapping anteater. Watch this, Martin said. Not that Dennis needed the instruction. Martin took the flame to Sketchy's face, melting the plastic until it ran like a burning candle. Dennis watched wide-eyed as the head of the figure melted into a drooping wet glob and the acrid smell of burning plastic assaulted the room. Martin almost believed he could hear the toy screaming. Once the figure had cooled, he brought it over to Dennis for final inspection. Judging by the look of satisfaction worn by his student, justice had been rightly served. The next day it seemed at first that nothing had changed. Nulby was as horrible as ever, and every customer Martin had to deal with was rude, entitled, and impossibly difficult. After his grueling register shift, he was rewarded with a wholly unnecessary reorganizing assignment, and by four o'clock his back was screaming due to moving twenty-pound bags of kibble from one end of the ground floor to the other. When the hysterical woman tore through the doors, cradling a shrieking chimp in her arms, poor beaten Martin had almost been too exhausted to notice. "'Can somebody help me?' she cried. "'He swallowed an entire bottle of dishwashing liquid. I don't know what I'm supposed to do.' Naturally, this drew the attention of everyone in the store, patrons and employees alike. Exotic pets were a rare occurrence in this dreary suburb, and primates were only to be found in the shabby zoo three towns away. A free-roaming chimp sighting was as good as a peek at a big-time celebrity or carnival freak, and the crowd gathered around the woman like a pack of wild autograph hounds. Not one of them offered anything even remotely resembling help. Martin dropped the sacks of kibble and turned to fetch Jeremy or whoever was on shift at the veterinary clinic. But before he could make it three steps, Nulby stormed past him, taking charge of the situation with his typical puffed-up authority. An inner voice tempered Martin's instinct to help, so he stood off to the side and waited for things to play out. Nulby pushed through the crowd. "'What seems to be the trouble here?' he asked the woman, as if his understanding of the situation would be the key factor in seeing it resolved. "'I need a vet,' she answered, not wanting to waste another second with this self-important dolt. "'Does this store have one or not?' "'We do,' Nulby said, adopting a lecturing tone. "'But I need to know what we're looking at.' And just to make sure she was aware of his station, Nulby boastfully added, "'I'm the manager here.' He drank an entire bottle of dishwashing liquid, and I don't know whether or not it's fatal, she said urgently, bouncing the simian in her arm like a toddler. Its roomy eyes focused on Nulby. Please, if you could just let me see the vet. The chimp reached out with a grasping hand, an act so charming to Nulby that the rare, non-malicious smile cracked his managerial facade. Unable to resist the delightful creature, he offered his own finger in return. He seems okay to me. The woman tried to pull her pet away, but it was too late. The chimp's face contorted into a mask of seething hatred, and it screeched, leaping out of its mommy's arms. Nulby had only a moment to register shock before the beast was on him, shrieking and tearing with its powerful hands. Gnarled simian fingers raked down the length of Nulby's stupefied face, causing him to stumble back in panicked terror and knock several stacks of canned cat food onto the floor. All watched with open-mouth astonishment as the ape, still clinging to its hapless prey, wormed a probing finger into Nulby's left eye socket and plucked out his eye, leaving the offending orb to dangle by a nerve. Then the beast dropped to the floor, taking a huge strip of the manager's face with it, as easy as peeling the skin off a banana. Thinking quick, Martin grabbed a package of dog treats from the nearest rack and tore it open, spilling jerky sticks in a pile at the chimp's prehensile feet. The ploy proved effective and immediate. 
the creature dived right into the treats with both blood-soaked hands and was back to its happy, chittering self a moment later. The hysterical chimp mother scooped her baby back into her arms as everyone looked on in stunned, horrified silence. A hand touched Martin's arm and he jumped, thinking for a terrified moment that it was another chimp come to attack. But when he turned, he saw Allison there, looking up at him with welling blue eyes, as if he was some sort of hero. After the police arrived and the ambulances wheeled the faceless and moaning Nolby away, Martin sat with his co-workers, Allison included, and tried to process the astonishing event. Animal control came to take the chimp from its despondent owner, and her concern as to its poisoning by dishwashing liquid was never addressed. The one thing all could agree on was that Martin had saved the day, and he was so flushed with confidence that when the shift wrapped up, he walked Allison to her car and asked her out. To his surprise, she said yes. The next month passed in a dizzying but rapturous blur. Martin and Allison went on several dates, movies, picnics, and even an extremely fun trip to that shabby, three-towns-away zoo. The fact that it all went so smoothly came as a shock. Martin figured his dating skills had atrophied after years of crushing loneliness and solitude. Allison blossomed something in him, resuscitated a wry sense of humor that had lain dormant beneath his depressed exterior. It was even discovered that with some light grooming and adjustment to wardrobe, he wasn't a total embarrassment to be seen with. Their relationship progressed slowly as Allison was still burned over Jeremy, and Martin, terrified of his sexual inexperience, was frankly relieved. But at the end of the month, he put his worries aside and kissed her at her doorstep, and was ecstatic to find her more than receptive. They parted ways with the promise of more to come later, and Martin was sent home in the glow of wishes fulfilled. Back at his apartment, under the darkened eaves, the diorama waited for him like an angry spouse. When Martin returned home that night and flicked on the switch, he found it glaring at him with the bitterness of the unjustly abandoned, and for the first time since its construction he felt a sting of resentment. How much of his time had he wasted on this child's fantasy when he could have been out in the world, living a real life? In the warm haze of Alison McCarthy, the diorama seemed nothing but a time waster, and Martin resolved to dismantle it first thing the next morning. He had yet to invite Allison over to his apartment, and here, looking at this testament to delusion and stunted growth, he knew why. No, this would not stand. He would clear out the space and set it up like a real apartment, with a TV and a couch and maybe even a cool stereo. He'd even get rid of the action figures. Some misfortunate kid would want them, Someone like Dennis, who, like the diorama, Martin had ignored for over a month. Yes, he would give the toys to Dennis. That would relieve the guilt he felt for neglecting the boy and settle things all very tidily. Then he could get on with the next chapter of his life, a chapter he hoped would prominently feature Allison. Who knows, maybe they would even get engaged. That night, Martin had dreams of a screeching monkey tearing at his face while Nulby laughed through the torn shreds of his mangled throat. Sometime before dawn, he woke to piss, then went to the kitchen for a glass of water. When he had finished drinking, he turned back to his bedroom, and in the growing light of morning caught a glimpse of the jilted diorama. It took him a moment to process what he was seeing, thinking that it was simply a trick of the light. But then his eyes focused, and there could be no denying what lay there before him. The diorama had been played with. That was the only possible explanation as to why, in his almost total absence, things in the diorama had been noticeably rearranged. Vehicles and figures were not where he had left them. Buildings and landmarks relocated to totally different places. Even many of the streets had been rerouted, an undertaking that would have taken hours, if not days, of careful dismantling and reconstruction. Martin's first thought was that Dennis must be the culprit, that he had snuck into the apartment and this was a child's act of revenge for having been so unceremoniously shunted. But no eight-year-old boy, no matter how skilled and motivated, would be capable of pulling off something this elaborate. This work could have only been executed by a true hobbyist, and the only one Martin knew of who lived within a hundred miles was himself. 
But as unsettling as all of this was, the thing that sent a cold shock of horror from Martin's ankles to his teeth was that the violating culprit had taken crisped, desecrated sketchy crumb and reinserted him back into the diorama in a most gruesome fashion. The nasty little character was standing there in bold defiance, holding in his hand a miniature kitchen knife that had been applied with a crimson splash of something that was meant to approximate blood. At his feet lay Dr. Millicent Chambers, a ragged slash across her throat where Sketchy, presumably of his own accord, had cut her and let her bleed out onto the fake asphalt. But the worst was Sketchy's drooping, melted eyes. Eyes that stared back at Martin in hateful delight, letting him know that vengeance had been satisfied. Martin snapped himself out of it. This was all some bit of mania, his worried brain insisted. An unusual but not impossible expression of the subconscious, the hobbyist version of sleepwalking. Somehow, while still in a deep sleep, Martin had come out of his room and done all of this by himself. It was the only explanation that made any sense. Because dioramas didn't move on their own. But this wasn't just any diorama, was it? This one had power. Even Martin's otherwise rational mind believed that and once he had gotten what he'd wanted from it, he had left it alone and neglected. Could it be that the diorama itself was making its hurt feelings known? No, that was impossible. He could not, he would not believe that. To prove that he wasn't afraid, Martin swooped in his arm, knocking the figures off of the diorama and sending them spilling to the floor. He stood over Sketchy, heart hammering in his chest waiting for the toy to move or speak or act on its own volition. But the charred action figure did nothing. It just lay there, glaring up at him with silent malice. For once, Martin was happy to go to work, if for no other reason than to leave the morning's troublesome developments in the rear view. But when he arrived at the value pet, the blanched white faces of his co-workers were not a sign that the day was going to improve. He asked Diane a heavy girl with perpetually greasy hair, what was behind all of the hushed concern. "'You didn't hear?' she said with rhetorical surprise. "'Ethan's escaped from the hospital. They're saying he even strangled a nurse. The police were here looking for him.' There had been whispers in the store that the damage to Ethan's face had driven him to the precipice of insanity, but Martin was too preoccupied with Allison to give them any serious thought. It all sounded like workplace gossip.' the trite sort of manufactured drama that made the hours go by faster and spiced up otherwise boring lives. But in the harsh light of his waking discovery, Martin's mind raced to a foregone and chilling conclusion. "'Has Allison been in today?' blurted Martin, thinking of Dr. Millicent Chambers and her terrible fate. He could feel Sketchy's runny eyes mocking him from all the way across town. "'No, she hasn't. Diane's brow furrowed absently like a bovine considering its cud. You don't think anything's wrong, do you? Oh, something was wrong, all right. Martin was certain of it. Using his newfound cachet as the store hero, he issued a quick excuse to his shift manager, a middle-aged woman who had been transferred in from some other flavorless suburb, and was sent home sick for the day. This sort of improvised furlough would have never gotten past Nulby, but things had changed since his reign of terror. Unfortunately, it seemed that Martin's former boss was not finished with him yet, and this time the torment would extend far beyond the terms of employment. Now Ethan Nulby was the puppet master, all the world his mad diorama. On his way to Allison's, Martin stopped by his apartment to pick up the only thing he owned that could pass as a weapon, an old cane that had belonged to his long-dead grandfather. Stepping over the mess he had made of the diorama, he checked to see if Sketchy was still on the floor and was relieved to find the wretch still on his back, gazing hatefully to the rafters. He took the cane from where it sat propped in the corner and swung it, the hard, mallard handle whistling through the air. That duck's beak could do considerable damage to the bridge of a man's nose, if Nulby even had any nose left to damage. He reached Allison's home, a cute little three-room bungalow five minutes later. At a glance, nothing seemed out of place, but when he knocked on the door, it swung open, having been left unlatched and ajar. 
It was not like Allison to leave her home unlocked. In fact, during the short time Martin had known her, he found her cautious to a fault. He had hoped that this was simply a rare moment of carelessness, but when the smell of decay filled his nostrils, unwelcome and sweet, all of his hope was blotted out by the stench. The living room was left undisturbed, and through the glass French doors that led to her bedroom, Martin could see that Allison was not in her bed. He stepped into the bungalow, and the reek that had assaulted him moments before now came in thick, stomach-roiling waves. Beneath the odor of rot was a coppery tinge, which Martin recognized as blood drying in the heat. And when he saw that the door to the bathroom was left hanging open, he knew right away what was causing the smell. Allison? He croaked with a voice dry with dread. No one responded. He heard the drip of a faucet echoing off of bathroom tile, and it dawned on him that he had never been invited this far into Allison's home. He had hoped to see it under more romantic circumstances, perhaps a consummating night of passion, but that hope was dashed more and more with every tentative step forward. He came to the bathroom and pushed the door open to the sorrowful sound of a creaky hinge. The sight of what lay in the tub forced his knees out from under him, and he let the cane go to clatter angrily on the tile. The bathtub was filled with a sickening pink solution of water and blood. Allison sat in it, partially submerged, her once vivid blue eyes now gray and blank. Across her throat was a slash so deep that the dry inner workings were exposed, the blood long pumped into the stagnating tub. Martin thought about that poor heart, a heart that would never be his, struggling to stay alive as Nulby stood there relishing every last beat. The stench of rotting innards emanated from her in a cloud of noxious gas, and at her stiffening toes the faucet beat a rhythm, drip, drip, drip. He went to the sink to vomit, but all that came out was a croak of air. Turning on the water, he splashed his face, hoping that the cold shock would drive the maddening terror from his mind. Behind him he felt those eyes crying silently for retribution, pleading to set right all the wrong he had unwittingly put into motion. Martin felt a dark and powerful determination rising within him, and he knew without knowing that it was his avatar, the Black Shroud. "'Go into the night,' the Shroud demanded. "'Go find Ethan Nulby. Avenge her.' Avenge your lost love. But first there was the matter of the diorama. It had to be stopped before its newly gained sentience could complicate matters even further, so Martin picked the cane up off the tile and raced home as fast as his wobbly legs would allow. So focused he was on destroying the cursed playset that he barely registered sad-eyed Dennis sitting there on the stoop when he arrived. Wanna play? the boy asked hopefully. But there was no time for talk. Martin charged up the stairs to his apartment, threw the door open with a slam, and immediately went for the diorama, not giving it the courtesy of one final appreciation. He tore into it, piece by piece, until it was nothing but ragged chunks of cardboard and turf. When he was satisfied that the evil thing had been sufficiently dismantled, he carried the disassembled pieces out by the armful, dumping them into an unceremonious pile out in the shabby backyard of the duplex. He was dimly aware of Dennis watching him the whole time, and by the hour of final reckoning the sun had long since ducked behind the neighborhood houses. "'What are you doing?' pleaded Dennis, standing sorrowfully before the ruin. As always, Martin's heart went out to the boy, but there was no other way around this. He bent on his haunches, eye level to Dennis, putting a hand on his small shoulder. I'm sorry, Dennis, but the playset was bad. There were bad forces controlling it, and I have to stop them. Did I do something wrong? The boy's eyes were watering, on the verge of tears. Of course not. Why would you even say that? Because sometimes, when I think things, they happen. It took Martin a moment to make sense of what Dennis was trying to tell him. Did the poor kid actually believe he played some role in all of this madness? It seemed absurd, but then it was no less absurd than what Martin himself believed. He was, after all, convinced that an inanimate object had the ability to ordain the future, and it was true that the events the diorama had predicted 
the ones that actually came to pass, had been put into play by Dennis's hand. In fact, the idea that this sad little kid might be the governing force behind the diorama's power was the least crazy notion Martin currently had going. Listen, Dennis, Martin said to the boy. I don't think any of this was your fault, okay? But if you really want to help, go inside my apartment and get my lighter from the kitchen drawer. You remember the one. We used it to burn Sketchy's face. Oh, Dennis remembered that lighter all right. He nodded, wiped back some tears, and ran off excitedly to fetch it. As Dennis was off on his mission, Martin went into the garage with the purpose of finding some sort of flammable liquid. Under a cobwebbed workbench was an old can of turpentine, the kind that dented inward with a loud pop if you squeezed on it hard enough. It would have to do. Martin brought the can back with him into the yard and emptied its fuming contents all over his once proud masterpiece. To his surprise, he felt no remorse in doing it. Dennis reappeared, the lighter held proudly in hand. Good job, Martin said, giving the boy a pat on the shoulder. He reached for the lighter. I think it's best if I do it. No, Dennis yanked the lighter towards his chest. I have to do it or it won't happen. Allowing a child to wander over to a flammable pile of detritus with the intent to start a fire did not seem the wisest course of action. Martin hurried back inside his apartment, returning a moment later with a roll of toilet paper which he jammed over the duck-headed handle of his cane, fashioning an unlit torch. Here, he instructed Dennis, now you get to light it. It took Dennis a few tries at flicking, but eventually he got the lighter to work and held the flame under the toilet paper roll. It lit up as intended, just like a torch. Martin hurried the flaming stick over to the pile, the once glorious diorama, and set the cursed thing aflame. Martin turned back to Dennis, torch held high. This way we both did it. The answer seemed to satisfy the boy, who watched the growing bonfire with open-mouthed fascination. The flames danced in the reflection of his extra-widened eyes, and Martin nearly neglected to extinguish the torch until a flaming scrap of toilet paper fell loose, singeing his hand as a reminder. With a flick of the wrist, he loosened what was left of the burning roll onto the ground and stomped it out with the soles of his shoes. Martin turned back to the fire, shocked to see how quickly it had grown. With mounting anxiety, he realized that he hadn't made plans for how to put it out. He was scanning the yard for a hose or a sprinkler when a terse voice shouted from the kitchen window of Dennis's apartment. "'What the hell is going on out there?' In the ground floor windows, Martin could only see vague, threatening shapes moving in the darkness. I'm calling the cops, the voice bellowed, distinctly male and likely agitated by drink. Martin had no desire to tangle with the kid's drunken father, and even less desire to deal with the authorities. There would be questions about Allison, suspicions as to her killer, and they may even keep Martin from his mission of bringing her true killer to justice. In fact, Martin had a pretty good idea where Nulby would be holding up. A wolf always returned to its lair, after all. And there was really only one place this madness could end. Take care of yourself, Dennis, Martin said. Before the boy could open his downturned mouth to respond, Martin was gone into the darkening streets. He waited by the Price Kingdom's garbage bins late into the night, until the after-hours cleaning crew that serviced the value pet finished up and went home. Martin hadn't seen any sign of Nulby coming or going, but that didn't mean he wasn't around somewhere, lying in wait. Using his keys, Martin entered the store and, having been granted the code by the new shift manager, shut off the chirping alarm. Now it would be just him and Nulby without the threat of outside interference. If Nulby would even dare to show his face, or lack thereof, as it were. Ethan, Martin called to the shadowy aisles. I'm here, right where you want me. He walked to the fish and reptiles section, holding his duck-headed weapon at the ready. Though the area was darkened, Martin could see the dim reflection of the tanks and hear the watery bubbling of a hundred air filters. Something moved behind him, and he whipped around, wielding the cane like a batter awaiting the pitch. A ball python had slid down from a branch and was observing him from the steamy insides of its tank. Its tongue flickered, and Martin smiled to himself. 
Sorry, buddy, he said to the uncoiling reptile. I thought you were some other snake. Martin began to feel slightly embarrassed. There was no one here, no one but him in a store full of caged animals. Did he really think Nulby was here, waiting to have it out with him once and for all, like gunfighters in the Old West? For all Martin knew, Allison's murder was just an unfortunate coincidence, and this was all some insane concoction of his mind, and Nulby was back in the hospital, strapped down in his bed nice and tight. For all he knew, and this was the worst, most terrible thing to consider, it had been Martin himself who killed Allison. Wouldn't it stand to reason, if Nulby was innocent and the diorama had no real power, that Martin was the sleepwalking arranger of figures, and that he played out his grim prophecy in the same forgotten, trance-like state? That sweet, beautiful Allison had met her death at Martin's own hands, hands guided by long years of solitude, torment, and sexual frustration. Was Martin the real monster, and had he been so all along? "'What's up, tapeworm?' a tortured voice rasped. Martin's stomach dropped, and he didn't know if it was from the terror of knowing Nulby was here or the relief that the madness was real. In the glass of the python's tank he saw a hate-filled skull leering behind him with its hideous, lipless grin, and as he spun to face the skinless fiend he was struck upside the head with something hard and metallic, most likely a dog bowl. Then there was only blackness. When Martin opened his eyes again, he was somewhere else entirely. Judging by the harsh fluorescent lighting in the innocuous beige walls, he was upstairs in the manager's office. He tried to reach for his head and touch his throbbing temple, but his arms were bound, duct-taped to the office chair in which he was forcibly seated. Somewhere in the room, a face without a nose ripped a wet, mocking snort. "'Morning, lover boy,' Nulby said. Sleep well? Hands grabbed at the back of the chair and swiveled Martin around. Nulby's face was mangled into a permanent smile now, perfectly matching the sadistic glee that tugged at the visible sinews in his cheeks. Behind him, the office safe stood open, its monetary contents spilling onto the floor. The setup was obvious. Martin would be found dead in the morning still duct-taped to this chair, presumably killed by thieves for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It would be a pathetic end to an already pathetic life, and the lazy small-town police force would never bother to uncover the truth that Ethan Nulby was his murderer. And Allison's. "'I'm so happy you came,' Nulby said. His glistening, blood-webbed eyes practically danced in their sockets. I was hoping you would. Actually, I sort of knew you would. Does that sound crazy to you? Martin didn't answer, but no, it didn't sound crazy. Nothing sounded crazy anymore. All of this, you and me, Nolby continued, it all seemed so inevitable, you know? Like we were puppets guided by unseen hands. I don't know how to describe it. Then don't. Martin said through grit teeth. Just shut up and do what you're gonna do. But you know what I can describe? Nolby was not gonna let Martin's defiance sour this moment. Not one bit. Allison, he sighed, as if in the throes of ecstasy. So beautiful. Not that I need to tell you. And not to make you jealous... But things got real romantic between us in that bathtub. But I felt bad for cheating, for coming between my good buddy Tapeworm and his new girl. So I had to punish her for it. Harshly. Martin pulled at his bonds, knowing full well that it wouldn't do any good. Nulby had done a fine job taping him to that chair. You're better off, trust me. His grinning captor walked over to a packing box that was set on an office desk. Look, I don't expect you to thank me for it, but I really do have your best interests in mind, tapeworm. I mean, who do you think the cops are going to blame for Allison's murder? If I were a betting man, I'd say you. Nulby reached for the box and pulled out a bottle of chemicals, some solvent used to sanitize instruments in the animal clinic. 
the label urged the warning, highly flammable. It's better this way, tapeworm. Nice and clean. Murder, robbery, arson. Pretty cut and dried, at least for the cops of this shitberg. And meanwhile, I'll be long gone. He looked to the open safe and the spill of cash. This might even be enough to buy me that new face. You'll still be a piece of shit, Martin spat. Always were, always will be. Nulby looked at him for a long time. Martin couldn't tell if he was angry, pleased, or indifferent. His lipless mouth bit off the cap to the flammable liquid bottle and spit it back into Martin's face. Then he emptied the acrid, fuming contents all over his captive, drenching him to the bone. After a moment of enjoying his handiwork, he turned to a desk, rifled through a drawer until he found a lighter, the long, tapered kind Martin kept in his kitchen drawer. The same kind used to light the diorama a few monumental hours ago. Tapeworm, my friend, Nulby said as he dropped to his haunches, flicking the wick. He placed the dancing flame under the cuffs of Martin's jeans. You're fired. Martin felt the fire catch instantly and spread up his pant leg like a river racing upstream. When the searing settled into his lap, he couldn't believe the pain he was feeling. It was as if he had never known true agony until this moment, and he screamed so loud that it drowned out the sound of Nulby's delighted cackle. He denied the bastard that much pleasure, at least. Nulby left him to his pain in the choking stink of his own burning flesh, fleeing the office with a money-stuffed satchel. He hadn't been gone for more than ten seconds, an eternity when you're on fire, before Martin managed to throw himself back in an effort to stop, drop, and roll. The chair hit the floor and he was freed, the heat having melted the duct tape bonds loose from the armrests. He did manage to roll and put out the fire, but the damage had already been done. His body was a charred mass of seared flesh and fabric, every nerve shrieking in misery. If not for the possibility that he may still catch up to Nulby, that he might yet avenge his sweet, sweet Allison, Martin Taper would have lied down and died right then and there. Lurching to his feet like a scorched mummy, Martin's boiled eyes fell on the box Nulby had brought from the clinic, and he noticed a large syringe filled with blue liquid, blue juice, the more insensitive vets called it, used to put the animals to sleep. No doubt a contingency had Martin proved too difficult for his murderer to immolate. He gripped the syringe tight in the melted cheese flesh of his palm and dragged his sorry self out the door. Martin stumbled down the back stairs, knees buckling at every step, until finally he was out on the ground floor and back into the aisles. At the front of the store he heard shouting, and as he approached the automatic doors he saw Nulby grappling with someone who was unlucky enough to have shown up for their shift early. Jeremy, here to open up the veterinary clinic. Had the poor, handsome schmuck known he'd be dealing with this insanity first thing in the morning, he probably would have stayed in bed. Jesus, Ethan! Jeremy screamed. What the fuck? Nulby was whipping Jeremy with a leather dog leash, and while the young vet had size and reach over his attacker, his inherent diorama-proven cowardice was no match for the sight of Nulby's nightmare-forged face. Just hold him there a little while longer, Martin thought. Just a few more seconds so I can jam the syringe into that bastard's neck and put an end to this once and for all. Just a few more seconds of searing pain. Oh, God, it hurts. But must keep going. Just a few more seconds. Raise the syringe now. Oh, God, the pain is so bad. Just a few more seconds. Just give me this one thing, God. Please, oh, please. The needle slipped into Nulby's neck, smooth as a knife in sand, and it took Martin's last ounce of strength to press down the plunger. Nulby stumbled back, dropped the dog leash, and in the reflection of the glass doors Martin could see his bone and sinew face twist into something that resembled surprise, maybe even defeat. He fell to the floor, lidless eyes rolling back, and following a brief spasm of limbs Ethan Nulby was dead. Vengeance satisfied, Martin let go and allowed his agony to wash over him, filling his mind with a blotter of black. He was vaguely aware of hitting his head on the linoleum, vaguely aware of Jeremy over him attempting to comfort. It's okay, man. 
It's okay. The voice was so far away it was like hearing a car horn at the other end of a vast underground garage. Stay with me, Martin. But Martin didn't stay with him. He was going to a better place now, a new and wonderful diorama. It would be so beautiful there, so perfect he wouldn't even need to be the Black Shroud anymore. He could just be Martin, and that would be enough. And maybe Allison would be there, waiting for him. As dawn crested between the neighborhood houses, a bleary-eyed Dennis shuffled into the backyard of the triplex, finding the ruins of the diorama still smoldering. Most of the plastic and turf had melted into a formless mass of chemical sludge, but here and there were items that were still recognizable. One of them in particular drew the boy's attention. He reached down, retrieving the black shroud from an unburnt cradle of faux rock. The grim hero had somehow weathered the flames unscathed. Dennis, his father bellowed from inside the triplex. Get back in here and finish your goddamn breakfast. With a knowing smile, Dennis slipped the figure into his pocket and went back inside. All content written, composed, and narrated by Sebastian Bendix. Copyright 2014.